And hello to Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to host tonight's event with Lisa Tadeo presenting her new book, Ghost Lover. We'll be talking with, she'll be talking with Zasha Mamet. So you're in for an exciting evening. Before things get over to them, just take a few moments for housekeeping things. Turn off or silent cell phones. Masks are to be worn during the whole event. Signed books are for sale at the register, and Lisa will be personalizing afterwards. And there is recording after this, if all goes well, that will be on YouTube. And just know that the store closes at 9, so this will be a good power hour party, but we do have to go home at some point. <laughs> Our interviewer for this evening is Zasha Mamet. Zasha Mamet is perhaps best known for her starring role as Shoshana in um, Emmy and Golden Globe award winning show, Girls. Mamet was currently being starring uh, opposite of Haley Cueco in the Emmy nominated HBO Max series, The Flight Attendant. She will be speaking with our future author, Lisa Tadeo. Tadeo is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Three Women, which she is adapting as a dramatic series at Showtime in the novel Animal. She has contributed to the New York Times, New York, Esquire, Elle, Glamour, and many more publications. Her nonfiction has been included in the Best American Sports Writing, Best American Political Writing Anthologies, and her short stories have won two Pushcart Prizes. She lives with her husband and daughter in New England. Lisa's new book, Ghost Lover, is an electrifying collection of non-fearless and ferocious short stories in which she brings to life the fever of obsession, the blindness of love, and the mania of grief in her signature art. So you're in for something special tonight. Lisa will be reading from her book, then Zasha will join her in conversation, and you'll have the chance to ask questions after that. So please, join me in welcoming Lisa and Zasha. for coming um, and thank you Sasha for being here I, I, you guys all know who she is um, my book's upside down so I'm gonna just read <laughs> I'm just gonna read uh, the opening of the um, title story in the collection ghost lover you're in line at the hipster sandwich place on a funereal block in the hills and you don't want to build your own you could choose from one of the featured selections but each is fattening Pastrami is the polar opposite of Los Angeles. You had wanted to make something yourself, avocado toast, for example, in your gleaming kitchen overlooking the Pacific. But you were out of avocados, and there was only a quarter stick of butter left, which meant you couldn't yield anything toothsome. You could have had someone bring butter by, but that would have made you feel spoiled and flabby. And even though you would have wanted Kerrygold, you would have probably said, Organic Valley or whatever, just no land of lakes. And the gopher would have texted no less than twice. All they have is breakstones or horizon. And you would have sat looking at the waves, thawing on your rocky bandage of beach in abject misery, waiting no less than three minutes so that the light brown-haired girl who was younger and smaller and poorer than you would have had to tarry there in the refrigerated section, wearing a sleeveless shirt on a gorgeous beach day, for you to reply, salt it. Sometimes the most you could do to make yourself happy was control another being. In the end, of course, it would never work out for you. You were always, for one, fatter than you wanted to be. Controlling other people adds about 500 calories. A delicious tropical drink at the bar next to Nobu on the PCH has 100 more calories if you're trying to make your assistant pay for the fact that you are on a bad date by texting her while she is on a good one. I know, I'm such a bitch. <laughs> Can I get you some water? Oh my god, yes, thank you. Is there only one cup? Do we have to share? <laughs> it's like post pandemic. I think they're not sure. Talk this morning, we're now best friends. Um, that I'm obsessed with your book. 
and we were just talking backstage about ghosting, mm -hmm. um, obviously because of the title. So show of hands, how many people here have been ghosted? Okay, <laughs> now I'm flip it upside down. How many people here have ghosted somebody? Wow, they're all sexy. Oh my god! <laughs> Exact opposite it was a, people. It's genuinely an even split. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're all fucked up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, okay, so before we just like have a fun conversation, yeah. I'm gonna ask like an annoying me yeah. redundant one, which is, um, what was there a specific ghost horrific experience that was the inspiration for this essay? Um, I just saw my husband put his head down, and I was, I was like, if I don't look at you and you're not looking back at me this entire time, I'm gonna fucking kill you. Um, so, um, no, you know, it wasn't. It, I wouldn't say it was him because clearly he didn't. Because I made him not ghost me. But uh, um, or as he calls it, I bamboozled him. But um, but what what he did do was I, and this was like one of the many texting things of like me and my friends when we were in our 20s um, and, and 30s uh, and you know, beyond. Um, <laughs> um, I, I had written to him, I was in New York and he was living in LA and we were like having this kind of weird like, you know, um, not, not date, like whatever, just like texting from across the ocean, that girl one night stand. Um, text yes, exactly. And I wrote to him hi one night, which I just thought was like I like, had a couple of drinks, and I was like, you know, hi. Like it was cute. And he like wrote hi. What do you What are you up to? And I was like, oh, my Caitlin's birthday. Blah blah. blah and that was it. And then like the next day, we're like talking on the phone, and he's like, I know what the hi means. And I was like, what? What the fuck does the high mean? Right? Like, I like, like what? I'm what? Please enlighten me. Exactly. Like, like, do you want to tell us what the high means? No, you don't want to talk? <laughs> so, the high, so I was so pissed, and I was like, the high to him meant, like, what are you doing? Like, like, I'm checking on you. Because he had had, like, an ex, like, there was a whole thing. There was a reason why he, yeah, no, it was we all have, fucked we up. We have backstory. Backstory. Okay. Um, but anyway, so I was so pissed about that. Like, it made me really angry that a couple of days later, he wrote something to me. Oh, no, he wrote hi, like he was trying to be cute. And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> so I wrote bye. <laughs> and then I like tossed my phone like somewhere where I couldn't get to it. And I fell asleep watching Tree of Life and with Ambien. And that was like how I dealt with my, my like whatever. And then my point is, it, 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 there were like 75,000 situations like that where it's not quite shitty, yeah. but it's just shitty enough. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> But isn't it also like life and a relationship? It's like the person yeah. that you're willing to, um, I don't know, a friend of mine always said, does the good outweigh the bad? And like that's the mark of a good relationship. I guess. I, I feel like for me, oh, sorry, that's really weird. For me, I feel like it's a push. <laughs> it's just like your space. It's just a push. It's just a push. It's just a constant. But yeah, I think like so. like pushing it up the hill. Well, no, no, like it's the good out, evens out with the bad. The, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like it's just like it's just. Oh, okay. It's like even Steven. It's sort of like, <laughs> like a trash compactor. Exactly. <laughs> and then you end up with your daily life. Exactly. So like, the cube of that. Precisely. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that. That's cool. Um, okay. I also I want to talk about could have talked for hours, but we were chatting earlier today, and I was saying how I feel like you capture this essence that is so fascinating and also so deeply upsetting to me <laughs> that um, I described it as like, I feel like we as women are all sort of walking around this like perpetual state of nausea, mm -hmm. which to me was the encapsulation of me saying to you over like an hour and a half, that like we all live with this like horrible voice in our heads. You said this great thing of no one can ever be meaner to us than we are to ourselves. Um, and like we're all living with it and we all think that no other woman is and mm -hmm. none of us are really sharing it. So we all feel this like deep shame being like yep. I don't want to be 
lesser than to my tribe. So we just feel like super nauseous all by ourselves. And if we, the only thing that really assuages the feeling of nausea is throwing up. You're like, yeah. you just gotta fucking purge it. Yeah. But for some reason, we never share these feelings about yeah. women. We just like keep them nestled inside yeah. like sad little squirrels. Totally. And I feel like you somehow, in all of your stories, in this book in particular, about all of these different women who like run the gamut of life and career and age, and they're somehow sad and you still also root for them, but you capture the <coughs> thing that they're all living with this shame. Yeah. And like by themselves. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that we are all, uh, that the shame is so, it, sorry, I feel like I'm like echoing in like a weird way. Um, the shame is... You, you suck. That's oh, awesome. God. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're doing it right now. Um, we live with this shame that is... The, we, we, we project it onto others and we get angry when we see each other sort of like doing things that are like pathetic or whatever. And instead of sitting there and going, oh, I've done that too, we sit there and go, oh my God, just because we're not in like a pathetic mode that day. Um, and I think that's, you know, and we were also talking about that and a lot of what I've written about in Ghost Lover and in general for me is like the ageism um, the, that is permeates everything that we think and feel as women. It's like it's either beauty or age, and when it's age, it's like when you're young, you know, you look at older women, older people in general, as though they, you know, oh, God, I'm never going to get there. And when you're older, you look at younger people, and you're like, oh my God, when are they going to learn? Like, like, you were never there. Yeah. And that sort of, um, that non-meeting of the minds is, I think, really paralytic and just not not something that is the seeds for us growing into what we're trying to grow. So for me, it's important to say the things out loud that maybe are like the worst things we could possibly imagine. It's kind of like, like I talk a lot about OCD, which I have in, in spades, and you know, it's like there's, there's thoughts that you don't want to um, admit to having, but if you keep them in, it's so much worse. Oh, a thousand percent. They just fester inside of you. Exactly. Like I sometimes have very few, uh, I was telling you this, I have like a, a very small, close-knit group of, of girlfriends. Yeah. I don't have a lot of them, but sometimes we'll text each other and be like, uh, I have to just get this out so that it doesn't yeah. fester inside yeah. of me. It becomes like a hamster on meth on totally. a wheel in your head. <laughs> totally. But that's interesting about the age thing. We were talking, um, I told you the story about uh, that differentiation between your 20s and your 30s mm -hmm. feels like cataclysmic once yeah. you crossed over. Yeah. And I think also before you do, you're like, that feels like an island that I'm never going to get to. <laughs> yeah. And then you get there and you're like, well, here I am. <laughs> exactly. And like everything changes. But I was having dinner with two friends and I was like 31 or two, it was a couple years ago, and they were in their late 20s. And I found, you write about it in your book, but I found like one of those hard hairs on my chin, and I was like, ah. Um, and then I looked around, and I was like, oh, I just got one of those, like, you know, when they're just really, like a dagger coming out of your chin. And all of a sudden, they're this long. You're like, that wasn't there 20 minutes ago. Where did that come from? It grew so fast. And I was like, you know when that happens, and you're out, and you're like, oh my god, I don't have tweezers, and I have to wait till I get home, and they were like, <laughs> and I literally felt, I told you this, I felt like I went from me sitting yeah. here to literally Shrek, like the scary version of Shrek, and I was staring at these two, I said to you, I was like, I was staring at these two, like, water nymphs, who were literally two years younger than I was, but I was like, oh, you're the meaning of life, and I'm a monster, <laughs> and it will never be different. Like you will forever be there, and yeah. I will forever be here. And yeah. like they probably got that first hair like six months later. Yeah. But it's just that divide, mm -hmm. and that for some reason in that moment, I didn't want to be like, 
oh, there's this thing that will probably happen to you. I was just like, oh, what? I don't know. <laughs> what are you? You're stupid. <laughs> like, I just had to like totally deflect and be like, yeah. I have to get away from the fact that I now feel disgusted. Yeah. And yeah. Um, how do I do that? Yeah. And like, that instead of like bridging that divide, we just make it even yeah. further and further apart. Yeah, because it's easier. Yeah, right? Yeah. You're like, I'm just going to go hide and yeah. cry and I yeah. go by myself. It's, it's my bad. tweezers. <laughs> my tweezers. Oh, man. I know. And a good pair of tweezers, are, they're so expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you drop them and you're like, oh my god, now they're uneven, they're not going to work properly. Am I the only one that does this? Yeah. 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 Never mind. <laughs> Don't listen to me. Um, so I guess that's something else I was seeing a lot about while reading your book. And like, I was so intrigued by when we were talking earlier, we were laughing so much. Mm -hmm. And like, that's something I admire so much about you as a writer, is you're writing about these incredibly, at times, very dark, very sad things. And you somehow walk this tightrope of still being able to find the humor within them. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel when you're writing these stories that are filled with like such shame and sadness <laughs> and I you know, I don't I don't feel bad, I guess. I mean for me writing is um, it's always it's almost, you know, even without using the word catharsis, though, I, I will. It's always like, um, it's usually always something that I've, I'm thinking about or something I've spoken to lots of people about. For me, it's whenever I've, like, talked to someone about something that they're like, oh, my God, I feel that, too, or I think that, too. And then I feel like, but they say it with that sort of sense of shame. For me, the idea of saying those parts out loud is exciting um it makes me feel more free and it makes me feel like it's um helpful to other people and i think that you know um i always talk about the cesar cruz quote art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable um and i'm much more into comforting the disturbed because i am the disturbed myself <laughs> and so for me it's like a lot of the stories in here and a, and a lot of my writing in general is kind of this feeling of I've either been there or I've seen someone who's been there, I understand it and you can get through kind of a thing. Um, so it's not, but I think at like first read some of them, like even the thing, the passage that I just read, it can sound kind of like, when I, I wrote that story, um, Ghost Lover, I wrote it uh, in my MF, when I was getting my MFA in fiction at BU, and one of the students in the class was like, you know, because it's written in the second person, was kind of like, I just feel like you're talking to me. And that like really pissed me off. And I was like, oh, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's cool. I mean, like, that's kind of what, you know, um, what it's intended to do is not, I mean, I, I did the same thing with um, the story about Maggie, the young woman in North Dakota who has the relationship with her teacher in uh, Fargo, um, I wrote about her, I started her section, her first section in the second person because I wanted people to have to climb out of her experience in order to deny it, in a sense. And so that's how I feel about a lot of stories about women, is like, if you can really get specific and nail things down, people can feel more for the characters and maybe more for themselves if they've had the same feelings. But sometimes the opposite reaction happens where it's like, I don't think that. <laughs> How dare you? And but they do. Or they genuinely don't and just don't even get. I'm like, oh that's you know, I don't like I don't get that. like not I don't get this, but it's just like there is there is a person there's not like one person I'm writing for, but there are there's like, you know, I don't know, a certain a certain person I'm writing for that is kind of a little bit maybe less happy than the normal person. Yeah, <laughs> normal. totally. Although we were talking about that earlier too. God, it's so depressing. <laughs> but we were saying how, you know, to what we were saying before, like we as women keep so much in and we keep so much hidden. We have this like secret shame yeah. that we think and we never share. That they, you know, ask me to leave the island if I told them 
like mm -hmm. all that. Um, and that do we think like we as a sex are all perhaps less happy than we could be if we were to just share these things with one another and be like, oh, yeah, you too? Yeah, me too, totally. Like, yeah. these things are so normal and organic and like, we all think and feel and see these things in ourselves. Totally, I mean, I think that if we did more of that, it would set off a chain reaction. It is strange because I think we were just saying this backstage too, we were like, it is funny how uh, overtly, as women, like maybe more so than men, we have this whole like, we're the ladies and like chicks with their dicks, and we give off this whole like, yeah, like I got your back. And then when it comes to trying to climb up the ladder of life, we're like totally got you. Also like just tripping each other because we're trying to get ahead. I like the move that you did backstage. Oh yeah, it. I literally you did was like totally, I got you. Like, you know, just again, like oh my god, what happened? I'm so sorry. I'm eating. That's terrible. I got the job. So. I'll take dinner. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, I love that though. I definitely felt that reading your book. My husband says the reason he's also an actor, and he was like, I think the reason that we make art is to help people feel less alone, mm -hmm. and whether it's like to help them feel seen or to help them feel like it's something they can sort of lifeboat onto during like the time of darkness mm -hmm. and from escape. That yeah. it's all just like there's something for you to grab onto. Yeah. Here. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I feel like your your essays do that in such a great way. There's like really something for everyone in here. Cool. Whether it's you know <laughs> you wanna just get real sad or you yeah. wanna laugh or you wanna be like, yeah that one Bit, like, <laughs> just like flip on through. I, that's what, yeah, range. Range. <laughs> there you go. Totally, totally. That's what. That's what also what we're trying to do. Is exactly. We're doing everything just, at once. I know. <laughs> I was saying that to you earlier on the phone. That I was like, I think the overwhelming emotion that I felt lately is <laughs> kind of just a general confusion. Yeah. Not even necessarily being overwhelmed, but yeah. just feeling like. Um, and I think in particular in this day and age, we're being fed all of these like differing narratives mm -hmm. um, as humans, mm -hmm. but also as women of like, reach for the stars, but also be realistic and you can have it all, but also you totally can't. And like, be a mom <laughs> of five and be a CEO, but also maybe don't have kids. But like, if you don't, you're going to be sad when you're older. Um, yeah, it's really yeah. overwhelming. It's totally overwhelming. And that's something, I think that part of it is that, um, you know, we've kind of moved into this new world um, view of, of, like, feminism, where the feminism is kind of like, there's a movement, and the movement is do not like that guy, don't like guys at all, don't like that girl, don't, you know, here's your prescription for how to be a woman today and if you don't follow this then the rest of us are going to just abandon you and leave you there yeah. and that's kind of what I that's one of the things that you know I, I've for me a lot of what's in Ghost Lover too has been like a lot of the sort of things that people said about some of the women that I wrote about in three women was that they were pathetic etc and for me it was always like I think that the very idea of calling another woman pathetic while talking about how we should have more stories about strong women is kind of in complete opposition to the idea of wanting every woman to be strong if you're looking at certain ones and going like, oh, but we're not looking at you though because you fucked up too much. Um, and I think that that's really one of the biggest kind of tragedies, and, and, and not tragedies, so much, but it is a tragedy, but an, an after effect of kind of, of moving as a group, there's the after effect of, of kind of looking at other people and minimizing them and, 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 not, and not being super inclusive to the point that it's like, whatever you like, whatever you want is okay. That's feminism. Yeah, that's really, I've never thought about it like that. 
but it's interesting. It's sort of like if you don't fit into this prescribed notion, I might catch your cooties of exactly. failure. Exactly. As opposed to like any iteration of what this is. It is interesting. Um, I was thinking a lot a couple of years ago about how we have become this culture. I mean, I feel like it became sort of um, be a man if you want to get ahead in any type of industry. Um, you can't have kids, like you can't be feminine. You have mm -hmm. to just be, you have to become a man. Yeah. Um, and this idea of like becoming powerful women became synonymous with being powerful in the workplace. Yeah. And holding a high power job, having a massive paycheck. And that we now look at women from a feminine standpoint, but like who choose to like be moms yeah. and or homemakers mm -hmm. or perhaps like volunteer like if they have that who might choose for lack of a better word to the bigger idea like a smaller life yeah as somehow lesser than yeah um and that to me again is so antithetical to the yes. idea of like we're saying like whatever you want yeah whatever you want except this except this <laughs> except see the sub text yes. below. It's exactly. like um, those commercials where the guy talks really fast in the end. Yes. It's like no side effects yeah, except, except like, and he says like death, death. and horrible and yeah. things really quickly. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it's like. That, this is horrible. How do we do this? Um, you guys, let's figure it out. <laughs> I, do, I do think it begins with honesty and, you know, being, um, being just listening more I think like I think one the other thing we were talking about earlier too was the idea of like everyone having a prescription for you yeah. um, no matter what you know it is it's like oh you're feeling depressed you should have you tried knitting have you tried yoga have you tried have you gone to a book have you gone to seven bookstores in a day though and it's like you know and the, the answer is always no you haven't done it like, you haven't done enough the answer is never you know, I'm sorry I, it sucks yeah. to live sometimes yeah. it can be really hard and I you know I've been there and so here is kind of like it's more about here is what I did rather than let me tell you all of the things that are part of you know our sort of toxic positivity response to failure and depression to um, to get you better because I don't want to deal with you like this I'll deal with you like that when I'm like that too it's really, it is so true. It's interesting. Um, I remember a friend of mine when I was really young going through a really hard time. Um, she was my best friend at the time, and I was just like in it. It was like late teens, and you know, the floods yeah. were raging, and I was like, this life is terrible. And um, she ghosted me. And I didn't tell you this earlier. No. And, um, and I remember running into her, like, we, we were inseparable. Um, it was like a couple weeks, and she was like, I'm really sorry, it's just, I'm in a really good place, and you're in like a really depressing place, and I just feel like you're gonna bring me down. And I was like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, wild. Um, but wow. I do feel like there is, if we're talking about this, I say my, how my best friend is trying to um, get her toddler into a piece transitioning from a crib, and she was like, I'm so sick of the fact that like every woman I talk to has an answer mm -hmm. for, to your point, like what I haven't tried or mm -hmm. what I'm doing wrong or what I'm doing too much of or not enough of. She was like, and I just wish someone would be like, it's gonna be okay, it's not right now. Exactly. And it fucking sucks. Yeah. And I'm here if you need me. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Like that friend of mine not only couldn't say that, but also was like, I can't, you're going to infect me with your sadness. Oh, God. That's so awful. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a bummer, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I had a friend once who, um, who I was, after my parents passed away, I was like, I'm feeling really depressed. I just don't. I wasn't like, you know, talking about suicide or anything. I was just really depressed and I was like, I just don't know if you don't so sad. And she was like, you should probably go to the ER. And I was like <laughs> and I was in this sort of like I like I was I ended up going to a, um one of 
to 24 hour spas instead because I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, but I was so like messed up in the head that like while I was there and she was like, giving me a back massage, I was like, I'm like, wait, I think I feel something in my breast. Can you can you feel this? And I said it to the esthetician who was giving me a massage, and she was like, oh yeah. And so I went to the, I literally went to the <laughs> for that, not for my depression, but uh, clearly it was kind of linked, you know. <laughs> but, but I sat there, I sat, and they were like, do you want to just go to a gynecologist? I'm like, don't get me to see somebody right now. I don't even know what it's for. I just need to see someone. Please see me, sweet Jesus. Yeah, we were talking about that too earlier, like, the idea of, also, at times, just wanting someone to tell you that everything is okay, mm -hmm. and how like so often I love yeah. you said it's about toxic <laughs> response that it is true. It's like we're so afraid. It's it, again the confusion. We're mm -hmm. in this time right now where I feel like like be whoever you are and like mm -hmm. everything just like cards on the table. But also there's an answer for everything. So like just put slack yes. on it or go to a yoga retreat or like yeah take up. Spinning, CBD. And it's CBD, or it's <laughs> Lexapro, or it's Transcendental Meditation. Like yes. something's gonna fix you. Yes. Because like we just don't want to look at your sad face yes. <laughs> anymore. Exactly. Um, but that there always seems to be like a prescription for mm -hmm. it right now, and that we also go to these people, like a doctor, who we want to just be like everything's gonna be totally fine, and yeah. even now. Um, uh, I was telling Lisa this story of this horrible gynecological oh, appointment I had the other day. I'm sure everyone wants to hear this. <laughs> I, mean, um, they, I mean, do I need to share? <laughs> no, it's totally up to you. Um, anyways, I went to the gynecologist for my yearly pap smear. All the men in here are like, totally, no, what's up? Um, she also was like, said the words everyone wants to hear when they go in for the yearly exam. And there she was like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I think I'm probably going to have to it's like, that's great. I'll see you in a couple of months. Um, but I was asking her about uh, pregnancy um, and just like super run of the mill questions and totally unsolicited. Um, she started telling me about how I needed to be really calorie conscious during my pregnancy in order to be able to bounce back really quickly. And she was like, don't worry. And she gave me like a straight up anorexia diet which is <laughs> a third of what i a fourth of what i eat now no carbs like eat less she was like eat, eat less, less don't indulge like keep yourself in this tiny box and don't worry you're gonna bounce back really quickly um and i was so all my girlfriends were like i would have fucking walked out and i was like i was so in shock that i sat there and then she was like, let's examine you, and I'll see you have to come back. And I was like, I want to die. Um, but it was so interesting, because I was like, this is such a vulnerable experience. I'm talking about this thing that is so unknown to me that I'm terrified of, that you're an expert in. And yeah. I need you to, like, just hold this moment and be, like, okay about yeah. it. My manager was telling me she was 32 weeks ago, and her gynecologist, she was freaking out. Her gynecologist was like, literally, this baby could live in a drawer for the first six weeks, and like you would be fine. Like everything will be fine. I wish it was someone had said that but to like, me. Right? That's and great it's, advice. But to me, it's, it's true. Also, <laughs> it's this interesting thing as well, where like we're so afraid nowadays of something going wrong or something ruffling our feathers or being upset or being depressed. That we're like, it's okay. We're gonna plan. Mm -hmm. for the future, so we're going to eliminate the problem, mm -hmm. as if also, like, gaining weight during pregnancy is somehow a problem. Yeah. And you were saying, you were like, I think that she thought that's what you wanted to hear as an actress. She was like, I knew you were going to have yeah. to yeah. bounce back quickly, but, like, I was like, I didn't even ask you about yeah. this, and you just offered it up. It's wild. I've never heard of anything like that. I know. <laughs> she should probably not practice <laughs> <laughs> more. Okay, maybe something else. Maybe just like, I don't know, yeah. work with men? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what did you say? You were like, was she also your publicist? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, she probably should be. Like, just all in bed. Like, all the other. Exactly. One step shop. Yeah, one step shop. <laughs> um, okay, do you want to talk about you... Um, 
you just drafted your last book in Tattoo yes. Show. Yes. Um, how do you find it's different? Right? No, 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 it's fine. Um, yeah, it's really different. It's um it's it's a lot uh it, it's weird as a prose writer to have to worry about how many words are on a page. I think that is one, you know, sort of starting thing, the idea of it being like, oh, it's over sixty one pages, I'm not gonna be able to get that through. It's like that's a weird thing, yeah. you know. Um, and there's a lot of more people involved. Uh, which you know brings with it a lot of different things. It's also can be super exciting and fun, but I am really excited about it. Um, it'll be on Showtime in uh, the fall uh, with Shailene Woodley and Betty Gilpin, who we were just talking about, uh, Gabby Creevy, DeWanda Wise, and, and Blair Underwood, who said he has never done anything more risque in his career. <laughs> in his career, not in his regular life. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, we were we were talking about Betty back there. We were we were laughing. Oh, so yeah, like, that's right. Are our mics on? We were genuinely talking. About, we were like, we're not talking shit. I was saying how much of an admirer of her I am. Yeah. Sure, a publicist. How I, my publicist who I've been with for years, like she's actually an angel. And you were like, yeah. she totally is. Yeah. And we were just saying how wonderful she was, and I was like. I'm just so happy all of the success she's having. You were like, I wonder if they would think we're crazy hearing us be like <laughs> talking about it, being so happy for another. Woman like, oh god, that. they're crazy. Do you hear them? Yeah, they're they're like, they're just like, like being nice and saying so weirdly funny. nice things about this. They work. must know their mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's definitely why they're saying that shit. A thousand percent. Yes. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is kind of a boring question, but I always. I always think about this because I I can't do anything with another thing happening when it comes yeah. to work. Like I can't buy my lines of music on. Um, I can't like watch a show while also doing something else. Um, maybe this speaks to like the capacity of my brain. <laughs> um, but do you like? Do you have a like a space that you like to get in when you're writing, or do you have any like rituals surrounding it? Um, no, I want to, you know, like I want to like, I have, I have, I occasionally like get a really nice candle and I'll put, like I'll set things up, um, so that it'll be pretty and then within like three days it's an absolute shit show. Um, so I have the desire to have routines. I don't, um, and I have a kid so it's even less, my favorite time to write and do anything is after she's gone to bed so I kind of feel like, you know. I can do whatever I want, um, but no, no routines. I don't like noise, though. I do not like. I don't like. I don't like music. I don't like any fun happening around me. <laughs> if my husband, who I'm sometimes in an office with, is laughing, I'm like, what are you laughing at? Um, yeah. It's the work day. <laughs> what, is, what is he laughing at? I don't know. Memes. Uh, TikTok. <laughs> bro text. What A text? Text and bros. Text and bro, bros. Bro, bro text. Yeah, yeah, bro yeah. text. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get those too. Don't worry about it. Um, that's so funny. Yeah, I can't. My my husband will listen to what last music in his ears. He's writing it's or like learning. Weird. Music. How do you? No, it's not right. Yeah, no, it's. Fine. Wrong. I mean, unless anyone in here does. Yeah, it. You guys, everyone, you guys are fine, but also something's wrong. Just something's wrong with our husbands. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Totally. A thousand percent. Um, do you? I have a desk, and inevitably, when I'm writing, I'm, I don't end up. I end up like on the couch or the floor or like on my bed or on top of my dog. Do you write at a desk? I write at a desk. I, I've never written on a couch. I have never written in a reclined position or a happy position. <laughs> I, love, I love that it's like no fun. I want to be deeply uncomfortable. Totally. You're like sitting on needles as you basically. Okay, cool. Not not me. Just not like I'm not looking out for my comfort in any way. Sure. I don't know why. You gotta stay sharp. Yeah. You're, like, you're, like, you're looking over your shoulder. That's coming for you. I don't know. Someone. <laughs> I guess I, I don't know I just know that I've met like whenever I see people like hanging out like on like doing this like leaning back yeah. like in front of a TV or something I'm just like 
I, I find it aspirational. I, I could <laughs> never, I can't even begin I to do that. Really Oh, I can do that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I don't know. Something about it. I'm like, it's not gonna, it's not gonna travel well. It might not. <laughs> and at that point, if you're just, doing that, you don't care really about how it's traveling. <laughs> I think it's just that's probably just like my my horrible anxiety. Yeah. The just the acid. Reflux. Oh, I don't have any of that. So. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you don't have any of that. Really? I also don't get over here so much. Me either. I'm also twenty-seven. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> when I turn twenty, my I'm no longer an agent, and I hope we all die for that. <laughs> no, 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 no. A little bit. Um, totally start lying about my age. At 20? Yeah. Well, you have to start somewhere. Someone the other day told me to tell my kid, because my kid announced my age to a group of other people, and they were like, you can't tell your kid the truth. What? And I thought it was amazing. I kind of thought it was a brilliant. I was like, oh. Well, that's kind of crazy. They're not lying. Yeah. They're lying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you like don't have to be there when they say the wrong age. But it was a cra it was a crazy. Like this other mom comes to me. She's like, you told her how old you are. I'm like, yeah. It's my kid. It's weird. Like, yes. She's also like a she's she's seven. She's like a fully formed human. That's it's true. Like, yeah, yeah. It's all like a two year old. Yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. be like mom. Yeah. Twenty five. <laughs> My mom like genuinely did, and by how much? I can't even, I, not a lot. It would just be like I think she had me late in life. She was 41 when she had me, which for back then was you know back back in oh wow, it's yeah. so, like back in like 2012 when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was like you know great. Thank you. I know, <laughs> um, but. Yeah, she, I think it would it would be more like she would lie. I think it was closer to like the like when she got up into fifty, it would be like somewhere in the like forty seven, yeah. just so it wasn't that next number. Because um, the like it was like you know, um, and I just I, I grew up seeing that, and it stuck with. So like for me, and I talked about this a lot, but like my mom um, was like known for being beautiful and so when she started aging that was like a really like different that was her thing and it would be like for me like I've never ha you know I, I've like I've I'm a writer if I all of a sudden like my writing got taken from me or my ability to do that I would probably feel as she did but I think we have this sort of stigma against it's okay to feel upset if someone's taking away your ability to write, but it's not okay to feel upset if someone, someone, you know, biology is taking away your ability to be beautiful and young. Um, and but these are things that we also concurrently at the same time feed into our society while lambasting the people who are also suffering for it. So it is so true. I mean, we really. Uh, Commodity in a way that feels um, kind of antiquated. Yeah, and um, yet still very, and still, and yet we still, you know, our biology is our biology, and so to like to live in a society where we are, you know, kind of saying that's not that's not the intellectual whatever. It's still the primal thing. So it's kind of it's it's hard. It's just hard, and I but I think acknowledging the difficulty is part of growing, and not growing old, but just growing up. I love that. Um, so something I am fascinated by, and also struggle with in that realm, is that I feel like, particularly in, in my industry, in any industry where you're public facing, there's this weird. Stuck in this loop of oh my god, 
God, she's getting older. And why did she ruin her face by getting so much work oh, done? Oh, yeah. And or I know she's gotten work done, but I can't tell what it is. Yeah. And so it's like you you can't win. No. If you allow yourself to become the age, look the age that you're becoming, um, you're no longer as um, desirable. Yeah. Um, but then if you try to fake out time, people not do for it. Yeah. And it feels so unfair. It's totally unfair. It's, it's really messed up. And I think the most unfair part of that is that, you know, it's like we all do things. Everyone does something. Everyone's done something to make themselves feel better about the way that they look or the way that they, and it's just like, you know, eyelash tinting, Botox, my, whatever thing that you do, yeah. to me, it's all the same. Yeah. It's just tweezing the dagger hair that you've <laughs> never had. Is It's all the same. It's like, but but we kind of, we, we read our own experiences and our own sort of feelings onto others, and we're like, oh, well, I would, of course, tweeze a hair, because that just involves a tweezer and a hair, but, like, going to get Botox, that is drawing, and it's like, why? You know, like, what, our lines are our lines, and there can be our lines for ourselves, but to put those lines on others, much as some other people in the world are doing about abortion, is to me, completely sociopathic. That is so, it is so interesting, right? Like, we as women, I guess not all women, but certain were like, my body, my choice, how dare you try mm -hmm. to box me? And then we turn around and like go through someone's Instagram and we're like, oh my god, the choices yeah. that she has made yes. are all <laughs> wrong. Exactly. They're all wrong and like, not just wrong, but bad. Yeah. And like I now judge her for them, yep. even though I don't know her. Totally. And so, do you think? Do you think that that's? Um, do you think we do that to make ourselves feel better? Yeah, I do. I think that every sort of shaming of another person is an insecurity. You know, I don't think that I've ever like judged someone else and had it be this sort of like pure thing where I was just so right and they were so wrong. Um, I think for the most part that any time I've judged someone, and I really, um, you know, I've really, really learned through experience of what it's like being done to me, that it's, it is via, it's, it's an insecure response and it's like you're just clawing out. Um, and we all do it, you know, it's not, it's not, the end of the world if we do it, it's just about recognizing it and not doing it again. Yeah. You guys, we solved all the world today. <laughs> We've done it. We did it. I think, yeah, I think, does anyone have questions? Don't be shy. Yes. Um, first off, just love your book, Animal, like, you know, in the face from, like, the first page, and like, I feel like you made the climbing out of it. Like, I wanted to shower, but like, in the best way. <laughs> and I was like, God, oh, this is so wrong and awesome. So I just loved it. So I'm Thank really you. excited. But as you express and explore these parts of yourself, and how do you sit with these things so that you feel like you have recognized and like don't just jump at the first like idea of like judging and then like come to fruition of like seeing whatever that dark part is within themselves yourself and other things that you've like given it time to air and breathe and like develop you know that's a really great and thank you by the way that was really kind um i i i feel like because of all the writing i've done and the interviewing i've done of women and the way that i heard other people talk about the women that i very closely had like, like I heard people, you know, essentially in situate, like there was one time I was doing a, a book event in um, another country and somebody was like, the interviewer was like, but like really they're just whores, right? Like that was literally the, and I was like, oh wow, I, that's a, I wasn't expecting that, I don't know how to even deal with that. 
Um, so to see that, to see people talking to me, like you wouldn't say that to people, to someone about their friend, right? But like because I had written this book, it was like, oh, well, these are subjects. And so having seen how much of that um, happens and, and how quickly and rapidly it happens and how it often happens when the person who's doing the judging is in a sort of tough place themselves. For me, it's like if I'm in a sort of bad place and I have a negative thought towards someone, I pretty almost immediately identify it for what it is because of that experience, kind of the way like a therapist might in that sense. I do have that, like it's like a reflexive thing. So I think it's like learned over time. But um, I'm pretty, that's like one of the only things I'm like, good at, at recognizing emotionally about myself. Everything else I'm like, wait, that super anxious just because it's like, oh, the deadline tomorrow and all of a sudden I'm like worried about something on my daughter and I never make the connection. <laughs> I'm just like, no, they're two separate distinct things. Um, but that I'm good at. <laughs> What's your name? Leanne. Leanne. Leanne just asked because I'm sure. Oh, you know, no, no, it's okay. It was quiet. Um, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, how do how how do and how have my nonfiction characters influenced my fiction ones? And I mean, the answer is a, a lot, and also to the same extent that like living life does. You know, like they were kind of the people that I spoke to for for three women and for other articles and, and essays are people that I knew and continue to know the same way that I have with my friends. So it's just, it kind of falls into the bucket of life experience, I guess, because of how long I spent on it. It all just kind of, but yes, it does a lot. Um, oh God, it's, you know, it's funny, it's like I, I used to, I almost never got writer's block when I didn't have someone to kind of actively write for, and there was kind of, uh, I always think about this as being a professional writer, which is like a, I, I air quote everything, because I, I do feel really lucky, and it also feels like not a job a lot of the time, except for when it's writing for TV. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, uh, <laughs> but also not. But also not. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I read. That's probably the number one thing that I do is read or take in another piece of art um, that inspires me and that makes me feel like I can break the rules of whatever is keeping me from being able to continue. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I feel like this conversation showed is how much you open a space for uh, changing the cultural conversation about what it means to be a woman and like having dialogue about that in places that wouldn't happen otherwise. Um, and you know, obviously with the TV audience that you're going to have now, I, I wonder um, like how you see your role as, even in writing fiction, um, as shaping the cultural conversation, especially because you, you bring so much, like, so much to, I just have gratitude for the way you, you um, normalize that pain exists. Um, it's not abnormal, right? Yeah. And that we have to be ferocious to preserve our energy and to pave the way forward with another kind of energy. Um, and it's also beautiful and erotic and so many things. And thank you. And like, you know, what, yeah, I mean, it's happening anyway. So, but, but I guess I would just be interested to hear how you think about your role in that conversation. Um, my role, I mean, I, I think my role is in being honest. Um, I feel like, you know, I talk about this with my, my friends and, and my husband a lot. It's like sometimes 
Um, sometimes the world does not want you to be honest. It just doesn't. Um, it's like, you know, you just, it, it's easier to lie. Um, it's easier to not talk about what's really going on. It's easier to tell someone that you're late because of, you know, being behind a school bus than having a panic attack. Um, you know, it's, it's just, there's not, those things aren't normalized. And um, I think my, my role, because I have that sort of perspective, you know, if I am late because I'm having a panic attack or I think I'm dying or, or whatever, I, part of my, my, what I think I can contribute, at least in the arts world, is to say that stuff out loud so that other people feel more safe doing it. So I guess that's, that's how I feel going forward. I feel like it's just more, more honesty, staying honest, even when it kind of, you go, go through this funnel where it's like the more honest you are, like the less people come with you. Um, but I think that if you just keep doing it, eventually it'll do that. <laughs> At least that's my thinking. Um, but I'm curious, how does your writing process and your approach differ like, when you're writing for, for like, non fiction for non fictional characters and like actual people that you met versus like your novels? Um, I mean, I feel a lot freer in general in, in fiction, I think. But I also really, I love the strictures of nonfiction. I love, uh, sometimes, not sometimes, all, almost all the time, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. and. Um, and being able to um, to meet people and talk to people and have them open up to you is a really beautiful gift. Um, but I do. But for me, fiction is something I can do at night. I can do it without anyone's help, in a sense. And I can um, and I can use the real stuff that I've heard from people that I or myself that I that is you know sometimes sometimes not. It kind of depends. Like sometimes nonfiction is the truer way to get to something, and sometimes fiction is. And I think it just depends subject to subject, person to like writer to writer, and, and, and how that works. But um, I, I love doing them concurrently. It makes me feel like I have boxes that I can, I feel really lucky to be able to do this on this day, and this on that day, and et cetera. Do you have like archives, or like how do you organize all these? Like, you know what I mean? Because I feel like you have so many like interviews and like subjects and people that you work with. Like, how do you organize all of these like different conversations? Like, oh my god, um, I have lots of dumb document names. I mean, one of I, I, I title things like really like everything that you know like in in our in TV show episodes. Everyone's like you know episode one hundred one seven point nine. You know like the date and then like all these numbers and I'm like I don't know what that's gonna mean. I'm like the one that doesn't suck. <laughs> it's kind of like you know um, I actually titled um, a story that I wrote for Playboy um, before it, it it's no longer sad. Um, I wrote I mean whatever maybe it's not sad ever but I it, they used to. I had really good articles. They did. <laughs> you were like, I wrote a couple of articles, and people were like, okay. But like, yeah. And they published some of the best writers of every generation. They really did. That's very true. Um, and I wrote a story for them. Also, uh, I have a gynecologist story, but um, I wrote a story called. Uh, uh, actually, it wasn't called that yet, but I, I, I um, went on Ashley Madison, going on dates with married men. Long story short, I went on a date, an undercover date with a married guy. Um, and, uh, and, um, and I didn't go on a date with this one guy. This one guy wrote to me, and I recognized his hand, his hand, like his email handle because I emailed with the person before because I'm a hypochondriac, and I realized it was my gynecologist, like literally, legit, like for real. Um, so I, I I was writing for Red Book, I, not writing for Red Book, but I was writing this piece for Red Book, and they didn't want me to like say that because of the legal stuff so like years later and I had kept up this because I'm I am a sociopath I kept up this like email relationship with this guy over the years just like like I would just write I, I was like in case I ever need to write a story about this I'll just keep him on like the back burner. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway this one night I, I remember I was just like sitting 
uh, downstairs working, and I was like, and this ed editor from Playboy was like, I'd love for you to write a piece for us, and I was like, Ah, I think I had an idea. Anyway, I wrote back to the guy, and I'm like, hey, hey, what's going on? Because um, he had written to me like six months prior. It had been going on for eight years, because he'd never met me. I was like this, like, it's crazy. It's cra almost crazy. No, it's my, my jaw's dropped, because I'm like, this is such, yeah. like, talk about like, research and backstory. I'm so impressed. So I wrote, like, hey, hey, what's going on? And we started, like, talking again and we yeah. start we went and I don't remember the app but there was an app for like that like it wasn't Snapchat it was something else that like only creepy gynecologists and their like late 40s would know about <laughs> and I downloaded it you know obviously and like we start talking and he like said, it was like asked me about like and he like sells his own lube at his office and like there it was just it got really crazy um and I did all these crazy things and anyway so sorry the long the Long story short, you asked me how I organized. Um, and what I did was I titled the story Dr. Fuck. And I, I just had, and I sent it to my editor, because, like, you know, I, like, knew him, and I was, and he was, like, great title, haha, and I was, like, yeah, yeah. And he's, like, all right, well, and then, like, six weeks later, you know, it's, like, oh, it's going to print tomorrow. We actually, we, yeah, we did find a headline. And then I was, like, oh, what head, what are you guys using? And they use Dr. Fuck. <laughs> um, so it's out there. Is, and I'm writing a movie based on it. So it's, like, it's going to be a whole thing. But that's, but it's, I don't think it would have happened if I hadn't titled it that. So I'm, like, just title your things, like, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you organize. Oh, right. That's, we're going to end on Dr. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel like there'll be any other way. <laughs> Let's give another look. Uh, and applause for us. <laughs> Wonderful conversation on the womanhood of the world. And we should talk to one another. So now is the fun part. You get to personalize these books.